All right, gentlemen, we are live now. We will start in another 10 to 15 seconds. All right, let's let, let's start because uh, I've normally seen that if you wait too long, then towards the end of the panel, you always have lesser time. So let's not have that risk with us. Yeah. Uh, good morning. Uh, good afternoon. Good evening. Whichever part of the world you are in, uh, on behalf of the panel, which is discussing supply and demand, the global COVID economic crisis. I welcome all of you to the Horace's Asia meeting. And of course, this very, very interesting panel discussion. We are very, very lucky because we have what I would call a rock star group of panelists over here today. Each one of them is a leader and uh, someone who actually influences their fields. And what is very interesting is, of course, we have a panel which, which is spread across South Asia, East Asia, Japan, and so on and so forth. Uh, how, what I will do is I will just do a small introduction to our panelists. I'll, I'll, I'll just give you the name and what they do. And I'll leave the remaining introduction to them. After that, I will give a starting statement and then I'll go over to the panelists to start it off completely from there. I'd like to begin by welcoming our first panelist, Tommy Long. Tommy is the zone president for East Asia and Japan for Schneider Electric based out of Singapore. Of course, he has a huge geographical and economic area to cover, and it should be very interesting to get his perspectives. The second panelist over here today with us is Rajiv Raghunath. Rajiv could not have been from a more different field as compared to Tommy. Uh, Rajiv is from the world of media. Uh, and, and that is it in its own labyrinth, I'm very sure. He's currently the CEO of Wellworth Media based out of Mangalore in India. Our third panelist, of course, is Saurabh Shah. Saurabh, again, is into global trade and commerce. He is the CEO of Universal Business and Corporate Services based out of Mumbai or Bombay in India. And his job is all about advisory, guiding companies which want to do business in India and abroad. So he's obviously got a ringside view towards global economic practices. And finally, last but hopefully not the least is yours truly, the chair for this panel. My name is Professor Aditya Singh. I'm the director of the Athena School of Management, one of India's most exclusive business schools located at Mumbai in India. Ladies and gentlemen, the world is in crisis. That is the one thing which we cannot doubt. Uh, this has been something, an economic crisis, which has been created by the smallest of things. You know, one always thought it would be war or geopolitics or something else. And it turned out to be a small little virus. So as they say, never think anything is significant because the smallest things can create the biggest problems. And of course, this is in some ways a repeat of what happened more than 100 years ago with the Spanish influenza, which is the last major global pandemic which we had. Uh, and of course, we had the Black Plague in Europe uh, about 700 years ago, which killed off one fourth of Europe's population. But in modern times, this is it. This has been the day or the year of reckoning. 2020 has very ominous tones to it. And I'm sure for the rest of our lifetimes, we're never going to forget this year for sure. <laughs> Luckily, there's just exactly almost one month to the date to go. So that's the good news about it. The world is in crisis. Economics are, economies are in crisis. You have situations where supply and demand is not being met. And the world has not changed. It has changed. Right? The, the problem in Asia, if you see, is that we have different regions and each have their own dynamics, each have their own macro and micro issues, which are there. South Asia, led by the Indian economy, which is the largest economy in the area, of course, has a different issue. Southeast Asia with the ASEAN countries is a different issue. Japan, China, Korea have their own micro issues. So what is it that it will work? You cannot have a one size fits all situation over here. Different situations will demand different ways of rectifying them. But the challenge is that previous crises have either been supply led, supply side led or demand side led. This is perhaps one of the major crises and one of the major crises we remember in modern times, which is led both by supply issues and demand issues. Are central banks doing enough? Are central bankers doing enough? Are governments doing enough? What more can they do? What is the what does the future portent for us? Is it going to be bright or is it going to be dark or is it going to be shades of gray? Well, touch wood, hopefully not 50 shades of grey, but some shades of grey. These are some of the things that we are going to explore in the next 45 minutes that we have. And I hope it's going to be a scintillating discussion. And at the end of it, all of you who are here with us have insights which help you towards your own countries, your own companies, your own professions and your own regions. So without much ado, I would like to begin this and I'd like to invite Tommy to start it off by introducing himself and his opening statements, please. Okay. 
thank you uh, and good morning, good afternoon, uh, wherever you are. Um, my name is Tommy Leong and I'm the zone president for Schneider Electric for East Asia and Japan, a territory covering 14 countries. Uh, when you look at the current uh, economic situation in all 14 countries, clearly uh, there are differences. You have some countries where uh, daily cases are almost down to zero, and you have countries where cases are still in the thousands. And so uh, clearly uh, the pace of the economic uh, recovery is different. I think uh, one of the things that we see consistently across all the countries is uh, whether you look at the public sector or the private sector, uh, you are looking at a demand for greater resilience uh, by people on how do we uh, manage uh, this crisis, how do we manage in a new normal, and how do we manage uh, in the future uh, to avoid such future disruptions. Because on the one hand, uh, what the crisis has done, especially during the lockdown period, is affect not just demand, but supply as well. Because uh, it was a struggle in some countries just to get uh, the factories operating, and to get uh, the supply chain working as well, which also means that uh, from a supply chain perspective, uh, many multi multinationals, including ours, is be looking at the global supply chain footprint, where probably in the future, uh, in, the, in the desire for greater resilience, uh, there is a need for shorter supply chains, uh, a greater multi-hub strategy, uh, in order to ensure a greater resilience um, in the face of uh, potential future disruptions. The reality is that the crisis is not over. Uh, the virus is still raging in many parts of the world. Uh, uh, there's, of course, many good news uh, on the vaccine, but it will require some time before the vaccine is widely available and distributed. Uh, and so, so because of this, it's likely that for the next uh, 6 to 12 months or maybe even longer, we will continue to have to operate uh, effectively in this new normal. And even after that, uh, in preparation of future crisis, uh, the world will be different from today. One of the things that we see across the region is, of course, uh, when you look at the, the government initiatives, uh, again, it's in various stages of development, depending on the situation of country. In the initial stages, uh, most governments will focus on protecting the wages of people, protecting jobs, and preventing bankruptcies. Uh, and I think in countries where the virus is getting more under control, uh, the focus in terms of fiscal and monetary uh, initiatives is now more focused on uh, reallocation of resources to sectors of the economy uh, that um, require uh, further investment as part of this uh, preparation for the new normal. And, and I think one of the consistent threat across all the Asian countries is there's a massive investment in digitization. Uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one, digitization helps to drive resilience. It helps to drive efficiency. It helps to drive agility because it enables remote, uh, uh, remote operations. It enables remote monitoring. It enables you to continue even when you cannot physically be on site. Uh, it allows you to predict uh, uh, issues. It allows you to prevent issues. It allows you to connect all your assets together, uh, to look at the data, to make the right decisions. And, and for a company like us, which is Schneider Electric, which is really uh, investing a lot and driving digitization in the solutions that we provide our customers, uh, we see it as a happy private-public partnership uh, in order to help prepare the world to become more resilient. Maybe at this point, I should stop and allow my colleagues uh, to, to contribute before I add to my thoughts. Thank you so much, Tommy, and very, very interesting insights. We move on to Rajiv. Rajiv, the floor is all yours, or rather in this case, the screen is all yours. Thank you so much, Aditya. Uh, uh, first of all, I'm, I'm really, truly privileged to be a part of the Horasis Global Community and to have the opportunity to speak at this Horasis Asia meeting, and that too on a topic, on a theme that has really posed seriously searching questions to national governments, corporates, and civil society organizations around the globe. Uh, it's about eight months, a little more, that the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 as a pandemic on March 11th. And what is abundantly clear is that governments, without exceptions, were relatively underprepared to deal with a crisis of this order. And I think the impact is already seen because the, if you look at the world GDP, it is forecasted to uh, contract at 4.4%, opposed to 2.8% the previous year. Although 
we are talking about a recovery of the world GDP to 5.2% in the coming year. Mm-hmm. Probably much of that would be predicated to the successful release and uh, and mass vaccination to prevent the spread of COVID-19. But that, of course, remains to be seen. Uh, when it comes to India, and I'd like to focus a little bit uh, uh, fundamentally focus on the India story is that if you have to typically look at the impact of COVID-19 on the Indian economy, it's uh, it's not necessary to come to this conclusion that it's, it's COVID-19 that has dragged the economy down. Actually, the economy had been in somewhat of a decline from 2016. Uh, that is, uh, you know, the GDP growth had been in decline. It was uh, growing at 8.2% in 2016, and then it declined to 7.2%, and thereafter it declined up until 5 plus uh, in 2019. So there has been a general decline. It has been explained away as an impact of the demonetization drive that was launched in 2016 November and the, the GST implementation. Somewhere along, the economy has been in decline, and that needs to be understood uh, very clearly. Uh, this year, if you look at it, I think the initial year, the year started out uh, on a very, very, you know, you know, uh, on a very difficult terrain. I think we saw the economy contract by minus 23.9%. And there's been a partial recovery where the projected, uh, uh, you know, uh, contraction was a lot lesser. And the latest figures said just that the economy contracted by minus 7.5%. So technically, India is in a recession but there is an expectation that the recovery is already on. And I think that recovery would mean that I think we would have ended at, ended the year at about minus 10% GDP growth. What is actually spurring this kind of a recovery as we see it is being because India is fortunate to have a good agriculture year. I think the projected uh, growth uh, agriculture produces at 144.5 million tons, which is very good. And the other is that there has been a manufacturing recovery, and the latest figures suggest that it's grown by about minus uh, 0.6%. So uh, the main points to be understood is that I think there is a certain kind of a positive news flow coming in. Uh, tax receipts have gone up. GST collections have gone up in October. Railway freight tonnage has gone up. Power consumption has gone up. So uh, now these are the indicators that can look at broadly from the point of view. All this suggests that there is demand creation happening. And there are certain supply side initiatives that have been taken, which I will probably touch upon a little later. But I would like to kind of, you know, uh, make one very critical point out here is that uh, because, as I said earlier, that the economy had been, the GDP growth had been in decline from 2016 now to 2019, it hit a extremely uh, uh, low level. Now is really the time for the government to step up the economic reforms, step up the liberalization, bring in a lot of efficiency, focus on the productivity level, take the industrialization to the hinterland. And if you are able to do that, I think India is very well poised to take a very dominant position in the global supply chains. Because one thing that the COVID-19 situation has given out a big, big message is that to diversify this, your sourcing and investment destinations and manufacturing bases. I think if you are able to unfurl economic reforms that are well calibrated, then I think India will be able to seize the moment from now until many more years to come. So I think I'll conclude here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rajiv. I would now like to round this off by asking Saurabh to introduce himself and get his opening statements in, please. Thank you, Aditya. Uh, I'm the CEO of the Universal Business and Corporate Services Center, and we advise and assist uh, foreign businesses in setting up business in India. We will provide a wide range of services, which includes business strategy, business support, business implementation, and very important, helping businesses to comply with Indian laws. And very quickly at a macro level, I'm associated with IMC Chamber of Commerce and Industry, Indo-American Chamber of Commerce, and Indo-Japanese Association. And I have one common point uh, with uh, the moderator for the day, Aditya. I'm also advisor to MIT World Peace University on Industry Academia Partnership in the education sector. Having said this, uh, in my opinion, the pandemic is a catalyst in disguise for implementing supply chain innovations. Supply chains so far have been focusing on cost, quality, and delivery. And now the time has come when they will have to focus and have very essential ingredients, which in my view are resilience, reconfiguration, and responsiveness. I think that's going to be very, very important 
as far as the supply chains are concerned in, in terms of the futures. As far as uh, the government role is concerned, I think uh, the governments have to now look at focusing on sustainable development goals and try and bring their objective in align with the SDG theme. This would be possible by implementing some sort of a target intervention at business model level, technology, policy, and governance. It's extremely important that governments realize that the allocation of resources cannot remain confined only at the federal and the central level. It will have to be made available with full discretion at the city and the local level, because the time that we spent during this pandemic in terms of deciding on the allocation and distribution, I think will certainly give a very big message to all the governments across the Asian countries to work on this. Uh, uh, with this, I will uh, speak at a later time when Aditya puts any questions for that. Over to you, Aditya. Thank you so much. I think all our three speakers have given us wonderful inputs about what their opinions are. And well, one thing is common is that, well, things have to start moving back. We can't have a situation where everyone sits pretty. Uh, do, have, taking no action is not an action which a government can or a banker can take into place. So I start with the first topic to discuss is how will Asian governments and the central banks and the bankers reinvigorate the economies? And this is critical, right? I mean, in the end, economies to keep moving forward. And what I would like to do is, I'd again, like to start with, with, with Tommy over here. And perhaps Tommy could give us input from a regional perspective also on what he feels is what the government and the bankers can do and are doing currently. Tommy, yeah. over to you. Yeah. The important thing to realize is that uh, the, the underlying crisis is not a political crisis or economic crisis. It's not war. It is a health crisis. And, and so what this means is that uh, this crisis... Will, will never be fully under control until the health crisis is under control. And, and so, so the first priority of governments would, should be to get the virus under control, right? Because everything else is just scratching the surface. Because as long as the virus is there, there will remain restrictions in place. And as long as restrictions remain in place, uh, economic life will be stifled. And so the only way things can truly, truly get back to normal is if the health crisis is fully under control. And of course, uh, all of us are delighted to hear that vaccines are going to be available soon, but it will take time. Um, now, having said that, uh, in the short term and medium term, we still have to live with the crisis, which means that uh, this is where governments need to use all the fiscal tools and monetary tools available. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the first phase was really about preventing bankruptcies and making sure that people still had jobs. And I think most countries uh, have done a good job in terms of managing that. Uh, the next phase really is about uh, making sure that uh, through monetary policy, credit uh, continues to flow to businesses because the econom economy cannot function without credit. Uh, at, at the same time, we need to make sure that the right uh, investments are made uh, into sectors and infrastructure uh, that would continue to boost the economy. And, and of course, uh, the best investments are those that are more forward-looking and future-proof. Uh, investments, especially in green technology, investments in digitization, uh, investments in medical advances, investments in, in IT, in semiconductors, in cloud, uh, because all these things will, will bear well for any country in the future. Uh, uh, electrification as well, because uh, electric vehicles uh, will be here to stay and will only get bigger. So, so again, it's about um, making sure that credit continues to flow, making sure that investment is directed at sectors of the economy that are relevant for the future. I think one thing that, that surprisingly, well, well, maybe not so surprisingly, that has also come to the forefront is that realizing that the COVID was, was essentially a human-created crisis. Uh, uh, there's another huge crisis uh, that is uh, 10 times bigger than COVID, COVID that's looming in the background. There's also human-created, and that's climate change. And, and, and it's interesting that uh, interest in sustainability and combating climate change has only risen uh, given that the issues that mankind has faced in managing, in managing this crisis. And again, the, for a company like Schneider, that's great because uh, uh, we believe in a world that's driven by electrification, driven by decarbonization, and driven by sustainability. So, so uh, maybe over to my colleagues to contribute. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Tommy. Raji, why didn't you come, you know, weigh into this? From your context. Oh, surely, Aditya. Uh, first of all, I think I completely agree with uh, Tommy that 
what we are facing today is a health crisis. And Tommy has also pointed to another very important part that is about uh, mitigating the climate change. Because these are two big, big challenges that the world will continue to face. And it's more so if we are to believe that even with vaccination, it is said that the virus is not going to go out of the system, right? It's going to lurk somewhere there. Uh, that said, uh, I would still like to point out that um, uh, be it the health crisis that we are faced with or the climate change that we are faced with, this fundamentally it is uh, on the ba- there are certain economic reasons for those. And so we will have to, the interventions will have to be made to address the economic, long standing economic issues that are there. And I would say that when it comes to India, I think there are long standing issues that need to be dealt with. And as a result, today, if you are seeing ourselves in a crisis, it is because there are some of those issues that tend to fester and they have blown up in a situation like this right now. So, having said that, if you have to really look at the impact on supplies and demand contraction, I would like to look at it a little sectorally. Now, if you have to look at the sectors in India, uh, take manufacturing, for instance. Uh, Manufacturing growth is fundamental to long-term sustainability of the Indian economy. And I would say that it would be the case for many economies around the world. But for India, it becomes very, very important. Why? Because this is the only sector that will actually help India to generate a lot of employment. Because the services sector, which obviously accounts for the bulk of the Indian GDP, is not seen to be, uh, you know, there, there are fears of jobless growth. Uh, with manufacturing growth, what happens is that it is job created, uh, job creation is part of that growth process. And because, and for that reason, the central government had for some time back, uh, what, you know, laid down plans for taking the share of the manufacturing sector growth to 25% of GDP by 2025. But unfortunately for us, uh, I think this journey has not been very fulfilling because from a share of 15 odd percent in 2000, you're at about 17 point uh, thereabout in 2020. Uh, So on the one side, we have grossly underachieved on the manufacturing front. The second part is that as far as the employment growth is also concerned, it's not even commensurate with the manufacturing growth that we have achieved. Statistics are suggesting that there's been only a one percentage increase in the employment prospects. So that said, I think uh, it's absolutely vital for a country like India to step up its manufacturing focus. And that is also the only way that India can relocate itself in the global value Uh, global uh, supply chains as also integrate with the global value chains where the forward and backward linkages are also very important. Otherwise, you don't belong to the value chains. Uh, Fortunately, I think there have been some actions that have been taken because, you know, the the particular theme of this particular, you know, the context is the government and what the central bankers have done. I think the government has taken cognizance of this uh, uh, requirement and what they did was they very recently, they introduced this productivity linked investments program by which uh, they have directed focus on 10 sectors by allocating $20 billion as uh, principally they have sanctioned for those uh, uh, development. And that includes uh, textiles and telecom, uh, you know, uh, automobiles, and a variety of 10 sectors have been identified for growth purposes. So the PLI scheme is supposed to also bring attract more global investments into these sectors, and that will probably pave the way for, uh, you know, the the supplies to be established and for India to actually benefit from that. So I guess, uh, but there the, the fundamental uh, point is that I think uh, uh, between the announcement and its implementation in India, I experience is that there is always a long gap. So I'm really hopeful that I think now that we are faced with this grim crisis, we will should be able to bridge that gap between an idea and its implementation as far as the manufacturing is concerned. On the agricultural front, uh, India's, uh, you know, 46% of India's population is actually dependent on agriculture. And so there is draw their sustenance from that. There is disgust and unemployment in the agricultural front. But fortunately, in a year like this, where we had a good agricultural produce, I think we have to take uh, heart from the fact that there is one sector that has been broadly insulated from the COVID-19 impact. And that is also because although India ranks second in terms of the caseloads, uh, much of this is in the urban areas and uh, agriculture 
where practices are much more in the semi-urban and rural sectors. As a result, although you know the uh, the COVID nineteen hit India in a big way, there are significant parts of India that have not been as badly hit. Although with the reverse uh, migration of labor, probably the virus did travel to the hinterland. Now, in this area, again, I think the government has taken some reform measures in terms of uh, introducing those three bills, which are meant to uh, legislated on those three bills, which are uh, which I've not mentioned those, but those have been uh, to bring about freer movement of agricultural produce uh, so that to kind of liberalize the agricultural sector so that the procurements are not limited to the APMC uh, committee centers, but it can be freer movement of agriculture brew goods across the country. They wanted to bring about e-highway for transactions in agriculture. Uh, they wanted to actually push ahead with contract farming. They wanted to take a number of measures to basically modernize the sector. But there have been very strong opposition to that. And I think today there are farmer unions that are have been up in you know opposition against these and in fact especially the northern part and now the government is in con in talks with them right now to address those. I think their main concerns are that they want a minimum support price for what they produce because they believe but their assertion is that the they will not recover the cost of production. And the second part is that the India's land holding structure says that 90 percent of the uh, you know, land holdings are with the marginal farmers. So without a consolidation of the agriculture, it's very hard to push ahead with the, the reforms process that is there. So what is very important is that as far as agriculture is concerned, is that uh, we need to have a much more of a consultative approach. I think we need to have a calibrated way of rolling out. And hopefully I'm hoping that there is no uh, rollback of many of the things that are happening simply because there is a political exigency. I would harp on this fact that I think decisions have to be taken on the flank of economic rationale rather than a political exigency. I think those hard decisions uh, one would expect from the the powers that be at this point in time. That is what is going to help India out. The third very important aspect is that of MSME sector, micro small. Yes, uh, throw fast because uh, sort okay. of. Okay, very quickly, the micro small and medium enterprises is another uh, area that needs. India has got 63 million micro small and medium enterprises. And I think that is where a lot of focus needs to be. I think I'll, I'll just uh, stop at this point in time because I may be able to touch upon some of the other areas a little later. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rajiv. It's been a deep dive. And what I want to do is sort of I'm going to put you on the mat and I'm going to ask, take you straight to the second topic and give you the opportunity to open that. And I'm going to ask, you know, because I think Tommy and uh, Rajiv have covered the first part which you're discussing, which is how they're planning to reinvigorate the economies. So my question to you is, is this enough? You know, we're talking about this happening and that happening and all of that stuff and which governments are want to do all the time. They keep saying, we'll do this, we'll do that, etc. Is this enough? And if this is not enough, what else can be done? Thank you, Aditya, for asking me this. Before I go into the details of this, uh, I would like to quickly mention about the initiative of Atma Nirbhar Abhyan, which the government of India has taken. Does it only mean self-reliant? According to me, no. Self-reliant is one of the component and the ingredient of a macro initiative. To me, what Atma Nirbhar concept and as an initiative it means is to create hub of value creation in India and not only look at the scales. I think that is something which is very important for to create awareness about and for the industry and the corporates to understand as far as India is concerned. Coming to specifically to your question, Aditya, I would like to state that the government has done adequate at the present times, but I would like to connect this with the immediate months which are going to come now. And we are entering 2021 very soon. As I mentioned in my opening remarks, I feel the time has come when the governments will have to revisit their focus, their strategy in terms of governance and will have to align their objective with sustainable development goals. It's important that the nation's budget are having the objective of achieving the SDGs. This is a time to revisit and rethink. And I'm sure that many of the governments in the, in, in the Asian continent will think on these lines. I hope so. Further, I would like to emphasize that the government's entire priorities, plans 
funding, execution, and the outcome measurement, they all should come under one common system of governance. I think that's what is very important to understand the deliverables and the effect thereof. We must have one common system of governance on a holistic canvas to look at this. And to conclude on this aspect, with interventions, timely interventions, targeted interventions across business models, policies, governance, technology, I'm sure this model would really bring better results and will be more effective as we move forward. And this model can be cascaded down from the federal to the state, state to the city municipal corporations, and also to the corporate and individual at the ground level. These are my comments. Thank you, Saurabh. Uh, Aditya, if I may jump in with further comments uh, uh, from a regional perspective, mm. uh, I think it's, this, it's very important for there to be policy coordination between all the different countries. Because uh, one of the things we don't want to happen is that this results in a protectionist uh, environment uh, uh, as a result of nationalistic and, and, and inward-looking concerns that, that some countries, uh, unfortunately, are, are displaying uh, uh, at this point in time. So, so the policy coordination uh, is very important. In the context of Asia, I think the recent ASEP uh, agreement that's been uh, ratified and signed by all the countries involved uh, is an important step. I mean, it's, it's not the only thing, but it's, I think it's an important building a block uh, in the continued uh, economic and trading uh, cooperation across all these countries. I mean, if you look at most of the countries in Asia, what has really driven economic growth in the past uh, 50 years has been uh, foreign direct investment, international trade and tourism. And, and these things uh, need to continue uh, uh, because uh, uh, it's not just about one country prospering, it's about the entire region prospering together. Now, that's the first comment I would like to make. So, so uh, uh, what, what I'm trying to say is that Policy, po uh, monetary, fiscal, political initiatives are not enough if they're just looked at from a country perspective. The, the second point uh, would be that it's not just about the government. It's about what private enterprises do as well in terms of how they re-engineer and retool themselves uh, to succeed in the new normal. Because when you look at the, the economic landscape, uh, you basically, for simplicity, two types of companies. Companies that are suffering from the crisis and companies that are strange, strangely benefiting from the crisis. When you talk about companies that are suffering from the crisis, you just have to look at hotels and airports, for example. If you look at companies that are benefiting from the crisis, healthcare, uh, anything related to cloud computing, data centers, all these are booming as a result of the crisis because of the increased need for digitization. But wherever, whatever, whether you talk about the ones that are suffering or the ones that are booming, uh, the, the need for resilience, the need for efficiency, the need for agility is there, which goes back to the story of digitization. Because it's also clear that the companies that were already on the digitization path before the crisis is also managing better than those companies that did not digitize. Because the companies that digitize have the ability to manage their, their operations remotely and, and, and operate based on the right data and reach the right decisions to be more agile. So, so uh, I believe that uh, it's a it's a, a collaborative effort between both governments and private enterprises to invest in the next wave of digitization, especially in, in upgrading the digital skills of its population and people. Okay. Thanks, Tommy. Yep. And Rajiv, why, what would you like to add to this from what more can be done? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, what more can be done? I think uh, Saurav and Tommy have really touched upon some very, very important areas. Uh, I think the coordination part is extremely important, uh, both from within the country and outside. I think that's a very important aspect is that uh, countries are now beginning to be more inward looking, which is a very, very dangerous sign because what will happen is that eventually uh, you know, trade will contract and investments will stop flowing and, and uh, that will actually impact the weaker sections in a big way. So having a much more kind of a proactive, uh, you know, global thinking is absolutely essential. And I think platforms like these also serve that purpose. Uh, I think uh, if you look at the core issues, I would say that time has come, first of all, to really step up the governance uh, matters, which I think sort of talked about, and making sure that the idea to implementation is really taken in right intent. How will that happen? I think there's got to be a greater openness. First of all, I'm very surprised that uh, at a time like this, we are seeing the communication channels are actually, you know, uh, 
are not flowing as freely as they should. Uh, there is not enough knowledge that everybody has of what's going around. I think things are getting a lot more siloed than ever before. I think we need to break out of those silos. There's got to be a lot more you know, integrated thinking, integrated planning that is required. These are at a very, very broad level, but I do believe that is absolutely essential. Otherwise, we'll become so closeted within the country and we'll get so closeted as a global, eco- uh, as a global community that uh, the COVID crisis, you know, in a matter of months uh, should actually abate. And then we will be staring at certain other really, really big issues. I mean, I was really shocked when I read the statement the other day that the Food and Agriculture Organization has forewarned of a famine-like situation in 2021 if the COVID-19 crisis is not uh, controlled and that if there are extended spells of national lockdowns. Just imagine, I think that is a deadly, deadly situation that uh, the world should avoid being in one. So that's where I think Governments and countries need to come together to do that. And I think that's one key message I'd like to uh, uh, suggest. Aditya, can I add something? If, sure, sir. Go so, for it. Uh, I'd like to very strongly recommend the public-private uh, partnership programs uh, for the purpose of delivery of public utilities, high-priority public utilities and infrastructure. Uh, I think that's one very, very important uh, area which needs to be looked into. Uh, Uh, what, was I audible, Aditya? I think I lost it for a while. Okay, perfect. Right. The the second point which I would like to uh, mention is uh, that the it's a time when the federal banks of the countries, uh, like in our in India, the Reserve Bank has a continuous dialogue with the CEOs of the sectoral and industry captains, uh, which are the important sectors. Because as uh, uh, Rajiv mentioned. The awareness, the communication has to be very continuous and consistent. That's very important. And third is uh, to take it forward from what uh, Tom mentioned about is, uh, you know, it's all about the relationship, the international relationship. And that is where I feel the trade attaches of the consulate offices and the embassy offices have a very major role to play because they are the ones who are there in representing their countries in other countries. And I think a continuous dialogue and roundtable deliberations will certainly help us to come to very significant pragmatic uh, solutions to the challenges that the countries in the Asian continents are facing. Thanks, Saurabh. All right, so uh, Tommy, what does the future portend for us? Is it going to be bright, dark, or is this going to be different shades of grey? I mean, love to have your inputs on this. I think that there's still going to be... um, significant uh, headwinds uh, moving forward. Uh, I, I think uh, in, in most countries, it's going to be a case of uh, two steps forward, one step back. Because uh, we discussed earlier, as long as the high f- underlying health crisis remains there, uh, uh, we will have third wave, fourth wave, fifth wave, sixth wave, uh, depending on the weather and depending on how tired people of social restrictions and, and then countries will go back into partial restrictions. They open up again and then restrict again. So that's why I say uh, two steps forward, one step back. Um, and, and this will continue, unfortunately, until a full medical solution is widely available to everyone. So, so at the end of the day, all of us have to live with this, uh, do our part, protect our people, protect our health, protect the, the health of our loved ones and our employees and our staff and our partners and customers. And, and together we'll get through this. Um, uh, the, the good thing is that, again, the, uh, uh, there are countries in the world where the crisis is under control. But the, the reason the crisis is under control is because there are severe uh, measures in place to, to prevent it from uh, flaring up again. And, and these restrictions, unfortunately, um, constrain and restrict economic activity. Uh, but but I think all of us understand that these measures are in place because uh, we'd rather be alive than than uh, <laughs> uh, uh, the other uh, alternative. Uh, so yeah, it, it, this is really a new normal. Uh, e-commerce we have seen it booming uh, as a result of the crisis. Uh, I think uh, someone said before that uh, the crisis, the, the the COVID has done more for e-commerce than than what uh, uh, e-commerce uh, companies have done in for the past ten years, <laughs> and 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 that will continue. So we are clearly living in a new world now, uh, where, uh, for example, for myself, I spend fifty percent of my time working from home, like today, uh, and I think that will will likely continue as well. I mean, even when the full medical solution has uh, is available, 
I think many of us have found that uh, it's actually not too bad for work from home. And it's not too bad not to travel so much and, and, and manage most things remotely. <laughs> which I'm finding a first hand for myself as well. So yeah, uh, so I, I guess uh, the short answer to your question is, uh, I think it's going to be uh, shades of grey. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Dan, Tommy. Saurabh, what, uh, what, how would you like to sum this entire situation up? Midterm and short term? Uh, Two minutes, sure. please. Uh, I'm positive and I expect a recovery in the year 21, 22. Uh, probably it will be sectoral recoveries, but I'm sure that the, it's going to change. And uh, I feel it would be a sustainable growth if adequate measures are continued to be taken by the respective governments and the federal banks. That's my view. Well, sir, that was really shorter than two months. Thank you so much. Mm-hmm. All right. Rajiv, that gives you some extra time. All right. Okay. Let me use that. <laughs> okay. I look at the short term, at the, at the near term, as something like one year, 2021. So if you look at 2021 and what we can expect out of that, I think that is completely contingent on how this uh, COVID vaccination will actually come about, how the curve will actually flatten out. And there are as yet no real signs of that. We are still completely dependent on the mainstream news uh, telling us that, you know, X number of uh, doses will be available of 300 or 400 million doses in the case of India uh, would be made available. We do not know over what time frame. So I don't think that we are going to achieve a mass vaccination in a country like ours with 1.3 billion people ever so easily. So we will continue to see this caseloads going up and down and states uh, placing certain curves as they're already our. Now, of course, Many of us would actually enjoy the opportunity of working from home, but there are a lot of industries where that's not an option. If you take manufacturing, it's definitely not an option. I think we have to achieve manufacturing growth and with a work from home not being an option, that would be a big problem. Secondly, uh, there are a lot of curbs on people movement between the states and even within the states. Railways is, in India is still not back to a regular timetable. Airports are operating, airlines are operating at much lower percentage. Intrastate, intra uh, city transportation is, with all of these put together, I'm really not seeing that kind of a massive recovery taking place. I don't know how the projections are for India to recover to a 5.6% GDP growth in 2021. I haven't really studied on what basis that growth will come about if all these constraints are still there. Uh, in the Near to in the medium term, if I would look at it from about uh, two to three years, I think it will completely depend on how well all of these provisioning that we have done. You know, what have we done? We have created a lot of credit supply, right? We have boosted the credit supply. Both the government and the Reserve Bank have done that. But if you look at the figures, the credit offtake is very weak. You know, their uh, credit demand is very weak versus credit supply is far outstripping credit demand. So why is the credit demand not happening? Because the consumer demand is not picked up. Uh, One aspect that I think we will really be able to work on is that if you're able to boost our rural sector, because surprisingly, in this festive series, and particularly the companies, uh, big uh, big FMCG companies, automobile companies, jewelry, constructions, all of these saw a boost in the rural sector because that was... 30 seconds. Yep. All right. So I think uh, in the medium term, we will likely to see better results if the reforms are panned out. In the longer run, of course, in the five-year period, if we see Industry 4.0, farm mechanization, MSME development, I think we can aspire to double our GDP. Thank you. Well, I think we have some phenomenal and wonderful inputs. I would have loved for this to go on, but well, 45 minutes is what we get. Gentlemen, it's been a pleasure and privilege having the, uh, being a co panelist with all of you. And if I may sum this up, what comes out is, well, the governments better start moving. It's very, very important. It's not that much of a financial or economic crisis as it is a health crisis. So solve the health crisis first. A lot of other stuff will get itself solved. Please ensure that you have proper demand because demand is something which drives supply on a, in, on a national level. Having said that, you need to have more supply, dem- uh, supply also in place if you want to on an international and a regional level. Very, very critical over here. And most important, don't lock your front doors. Don't button up your windows and say, oh, my God, I'm going to stay inside my country and be safe because that's not how the world looks anymore. You have to go international. We are bang out of time. Thank you so much. It's been a wonderful pleasure and a privilege with all of you over here. And thank you to all our attendees over here. God bless, and God bless to all of you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Pleasure being here. Thank you. I'm thank stopping. You. Please be still online. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>